Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shah Zakram, and I'm the Deputy Director at the Fulbright Association. Welcome, and thanks for joining our Career Services for Young Professionals, specially created to support the newly returned Fulbright alumni, as well as the young professionals in our network. The Fulbright Association is an independent nonprofit established in 1977, representing 140,000 U.S. alumni through our 54 local chapters, the association hosts more than 230 regional and national programs each year. We advocate for the program and promote international education. We also invite you to subscribe to our mailing list and join as a member at Fulbright.org, if not done so already. So now I would like to introduce our two speakers, Andrew Evans and Liz Newman. We also have David Smith, who will um, be joining part of the discussion. Andrew is a retired CFO, CFO from Wellesley College. He has served in the Foreign Service with USAID overseas and in Washington, D.C., and later served as Associate Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He's also a Fulbrighter, went to the U.K. in 1992 as a Fulbright Administrator uh, on, on a Fulbright Administrator grant. Liz Newman has over 30 years. Liz, um, um, uh, you could also wave like Andy, <laughs> has over 30 years of experience in financial management, organizational consulting, and executive search. With an established track record of serving clients in higher ed, Liz is a trusted confidant and advisor to university presidents, provosts, and boards. She's also a recently retired managing partner at Koya Leadership Partners. And now I'd like to introduce Lisa Boucher, our program manager, also a Fulbrighter, ETA to Peru. Lisa. Hi, everyone. Thank you, um, Shaz, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, like Shaz said, I'm the program manager at the Fulbright Association. I did an ETA to Peru in 2016. Uh, so hello, ETAs, fellow ETAs. Um, I just want to give a few norms for today's uh, presentation. So we do ask that you keep your microphones on mute just to minimize any background noise, but we do welcome you to turn on your videos if you would like us to be able to see you and interact with you. Um, just to make it feel more personal, you're welcome to do that. If you have a question that you would like to ask, you are welcome to use the, the raise hand option. It's if you look on your screen, the participant screen on the right hand side, you'll see little icons and you can click um, the icon right underneath where it says invite, uh, mute me, or raise hand. And if you click that little hand button like David Smith is doing, you will see that there's a little hand that comes up like you're raising your hand. And then we can know to call on you to ask a question. Otherwise, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, you can just type your question in the chat box. And I do just wanna remind everyone that we are recording this session. So if you do choose to ask a question on the video and your camera is on, you will be captured in our video and you will be put on our YouTube channel so you can be Fulbright famous. So um, <laughs> we look forward to seeing your questions and uh, talking with you today. And with that, I'll hand it off to Liz and Andy. Hi everyone. Thank you for joining our Fulbright Association webinar today. And today is focused on volunteerism and really thinking about volunteering as a way to build your own personal skills. And we'll talk about um, five different aspects here. We'll talk about what are the national trends in volunteering? Um, and as a volunteer, what are the benefits? Um, really how to get started and what are you passionate about, which is a, an important first step, and where to look, and then other learning possibilities. So the COVID-19 pandemic has really heightened interest in volunteering. Um, you read every day about amazing stories of how volunteers, first line volunteers, have made an impact on their communities. And those examples are homegrown, such as sewing masks for various groups, uh, other groups. And then there are sort of more uh, informal ones, such as delivering food to elders in the immediate community or through a large nonprofits as well, working at a food bank, that kind of thing. And some of these opportunities are performed virtually at home, so you can do them without leaving the house. And then others are done in person with the appropriate social distancing. What was interesting to me was that there was a 2015 study, so quite a while ago, but more than 25% of Americans were volunteering through an organization. And that seemed like quite a high number to me. But 
what the article I was reading also said was that given the harsh multi-year impact of the pandemic on many families, that the need for volunteers will really only increase in the coming months and years. And from the Fulbright resumes that some of you have shared with us, many of you have already been volunteering and doing absolutely amazing work. And thank you for that. That's just wonderful. So the question I think to be answered is why should we volunteer? Um, organizations need volunteers because otherwise they don't have a, enough paid staff to meet the needs of the mission and, and in their communities. And second, there's data, this goes back quite a ways, but there's data that strongly suggests that people's well-being is positively impact, impacted when you volunteer. And when you volunteer, the organization accomplishes its mission and the volunteers also get leadership training skills flexibility skills, and really the ability to take initiative. I know there are situations when you volunteer in a daily situation, and that situation can change rapidly. There can be a uh, fewer number of volunteers on that day than were expected, or the amount of supplies can change, and all of that requires you uh, to be a problem solver on the spot. So these are important things to consider. And Liz. To continue the some of the research that Andy was talking about, um, uh, uh, volunteering can be personally good for us, emotionally good for us. There is some research that shows that volunteering can lead to levels of happiness that are equivalent to a life-changing salary boost, which right now could be a really wonderful thing to feel, I think. <laughs> it's a good analogy. Um, it helps the community. Um, when people work together, the health of the people in the organization, um, improves, it can impact animals positively. It just, there's, there's really no downside is what I would say. Um, the concept of giving back may be meaningful to some and at the same time, just being in a community, even if it's a Zoom or virtual community, gives you some level of um, warmth and um, happiness, I say. It adds to your, to your well-being. Right. So, um, also in, in, in thinking about this, there are, you may want to explore the concepts of something called service learning. And service learning integrates the meaningful community service with learning and reflection on how to enrich that experience. And of course, the service itself is very meaningful, but for the experience to be personally enriching, there might also be a component of learning in that. And that's something that uh, is important for many. And also that uh, you find that social justice is often uh, a key underlying component and that may enhance the feelings that you have about spending time on this work. And sometimes it's a significant amount of time. So I think it's important that you, that, that helps to feel like you're learning something. And um, there are desired outcomes in service learning and they might include a whole variety of things. And among them would be to enhance your understanding of the conditions or the problem that the organization is trying to address and to maybe explore the background, the circumstances that led to those conditions. Um, you might also uh, find yourself forming an empathetic connection with those whom they are assisting. And uh, this is more of a, a business side is that you're also developing a familiarity with the structure of the agency or the organization and how that structure works to accomplish its mission. Not all uh, organizations work the same, some have very flat organizations, some have very hierarchical organizations. And so I think from a, from a, a business point of view, in a sense that watching how that works is also a, a learning experience. You also uh, understand, get to understand how the gift of time, talent, or money ha has helped. So that uh, these are the sort of the three aspects, time, talent, and money. And um, you can see that you may have large donations, that helps in one way but also a large number of volunteers, talent can help in other ways as well. And um, I think it's important also that, um, to believe that people can use their strengths, skills, and assets for the greater good. I think that's the motivation. And that ultimately you can make a difference in the world and that the world can make a difference to us as volunteers. So um, if you're thinking about this, you should research organizations or groups that feature service learning. Um, that might be locally, it might be uh, nationally or internationally, but uh, the service learning component is something I think of great interest and I would encourage you to check it out. 
So um, as you begin to think about devoting time to volunteering, it's probably a good idea to be um, strategic about it. Uh, I'll use a very different example from my own life. I recently retired and um, was really excited about the possibilities of doing volunteering. And so I can tell you still in my inbox and through my text, I have numerous, numerous organizations sending me newsletters and emails. It, it was very easy to, to almost be overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that's out there. So as you think about this, think about what you're passionate about. Is it healthcare, homelessness, food, nutrition? Um, do you like tutoring and teaching people, mentoring, um, animal welfare, politics, getting out the vote? It's an important political year, as we all know. And then think about um, if I'm healthy, can I do this? Um, like the Red Cross has blood drives going on, um, but they also have virtual things going on. So um, if I'm healthy and not at risk, can I be out in the community or do I need to do this from my home? Is it more convenient to do it from my home? Are my hours flexible? Um, how much time do I wanna commit on a weekly or monthly basis? Um, what equipment do I have that would might be necessary? Computers, cars, phones. Um, and then um, is this something where I would donate versus actually spend the time doing it if I can afford to do that? So there are lots of different ways of looking at this and sort of having that list in front of you as you're looking at opportunities, I think would be really helpful. Yeah, I, I would echo what Liz just said about what am I passionate about. I think it's very important to start at that place and then move on from there. Um, and it can be, you know, where do you look? In the, it can be quite close. So it could be in the neighborhood. It may be uh, at, in your own home or with your extended family. Those are all possibilities. But then maybe, you know, moving out a little bit, what might your neighbors need and how could you assist them? And then moving further, then uh, looking at national or international organizations. They're, they have wonderful websites that talk about the opportunities that they have uh, for volunteers and they give great ideas, quite honestly. So just to name a few, the International Red Cross, the Doctors Without Borders, Salvation Army, YMCA, w, y, YWCA, Rotary Clubs, faith-based organizations, mutual aid organizations, food pantries and food banks, uh, Big Brother and Big Sister. And then to continue, the list really is pretty long. I mean, it's vast. Um, there are hotlines looking for people to call. I recently got a, an opportunity that came across one of the websites I'm on about um, loneliness, calling up other seniors who might be alone and just talking to them, suicide hotlines. Um, we're listing a few websites here. Amava is one I found to be really interesting. It also, it not only does, does volunteerism, it has part-time and full-time jobs, interesting opportunities. Um, Idealist, GuideStar, um, volunteer.match. Um, and then the thing that I, I belong to an association in Boston called bostoncares.org. And I'm imagining that every city has something like this. So um, when I had a really small organization that where we did not think about volunteering as a group, I joined this organization because they put groups of people together and send them to um, homeless inns to feed people so you can show up at a certain time or food banks. And it's hard if you're just one person sometimes to find some of these volunteer opportunities. Um, they train you, they have all kinds of things going on. So I would say, I think I, did a little research in Philadelphia for some reason, and I forget what it's called there, but I'm sure each city has something like that, and it's just full of great opportunities and connections. Yeah, and there's no shortage of, of uh, websites that you can, can go on and really look to find a wide variety of possibilities. And again, going back to finding out what, what, is, what you're passionate about. So Liz. So then, I mean, you've got to, if you've got time on your hands, um, what else can you do? Learn a new language, get certifications for teaching languages. Um, the Red Cross has all kinds of trainees that certify you not only for doing work for them, but for other work. Um, beef up on your technology, um, sign up for newsletters. Um, it, it's, it's amazing what you can read and learn just through some of the things that are out there now sewing masks. 
uh, or um, there are non-sewable masks too. Use your old t-shirts to make masks. <laughs> Lots of opportunity. So um, what we're hoping what we can do now is to learn some ideas from all of you that you could share with each other, uh, volunteer ideas that you've experienced. And um, we have uh, on the line here today with us, David Smith, our colleague, and uh, David is a teacher, a writer, a consultant, an innovator, and a Fulbright recipient, as you heard. And so, David, maybe you might tell us what you Sure, been sure. Uh, thanks, Andy and Liz. And I, I want to uh, kind of build on something I think maybe you imply, but I think it's really important, and that's the idea of strategic volunteering. So strategic volunteering is thinking about volunteering that helps you build your resume, build your experience, right? So there are lots of things that we may be interested in and all things being equal, the low hanging fruit. Um, think about something that if you looked at all the things that you've done that you're presenting yourself at, as is there something, is there a gap, is there a perspective that you could get through volunteering? And that's being strategic about it. Recognize that, you know, what the series is all about is getting work. Um, and how does volunteering propel you to that? So be a little bit strategic about it, thinking about what it is, is that you need and where volunteering can get that to you. And the, the reason I say that is I was on a webinar yesterday with somebody from the Office of Personnel Management, um, which is really the organization that runs usajobs.gov. Uh, and she, the whole session was about writing a resume, uh, a government resume, a federal resume, and they could not emphasize enough volunteerism and how volunteerism to usajobs.gov and the federal government basically counts as a job. So if you volunteer, it makes no difference to them whether you're getting paid or not, just as long as you list how long it was, they see that as an equivalency in terms of experience. So that's really important to remember. Another thing that there's a trend that I am seeing is what we would call project-based volunteerism. That is, all of our work is moving to project-based in some respects. Internships are project-based. I run a small NGO and um, I just hire two interns for 20 hours each. 20-hour uh, internships that are virtual, running or going around a specific project. If you're volunteering rather than kind of an open-end volunteerism, maybe proposing a project to an organization. Maybe you identify an organization that you really would like to do something with. And in looking at what they're doing, you're seeing, hey, there's a kind of a gap here. Maybe they could build their social media a little bit. Maybe I could support <laughs> this or support that. Coming to them with an idea of, here's a project that I could do for you as a volunteer it would take 20 hours to do something like that. So that's another idea, a way of you basically not kind of going to them for ideas, coming with an idea of how you might volunteer. And the last thing I would add, and, and uh, Liz and Andy put together a really great list of organizations to reach out to, but don't forget your local Fulbright Association chapter, right? Go to them. These are all professionals who are working in the community. Many of them are academics. Many of them are with organizations. Your first at this point should have joined a local Fulbright Association chapter and make sure that you do that and really go to them and say, here I am, I've got this time on my hands. What would you recommend that I volunteer for? Because they're likely going to put you in touch with people who are also connected in the Fulbright community that really could put you in some great opportunities. So those are some of the things that I would add. I think what, what Andy and Liz covered was really well done, but think strategic as I would say more than anything else when you're thinking about volunteering. So expanding a little bit on what David said um, about looking for uh, the volunteer experience that would actually help you uh, in your job search later on. We talked last time about, uh, uh, it, you may get questions about what did you do during COVID-19? How did the COVID-19 pandemic impact your life and so on? Many of you have had experiences now where you had to give up something in order to get back into the country uh, and uh, that was uh, disappointing. But at the same time, you could turn this time that is available to you into learning a new skill through this volunteer experience. Right. And I think that's really important that people will wanna ask, uh, so what did you do? And then if you're able to describe something that is actually meaningful to you as a person, but also was helpful to the community you were hoping to, to help, that that is very persuasive to employers and they will see that as something as, oh, this person has drive and that would be something that we could use in this particular role. So 
That's an yeah. important piece. Yeah, I, I've got a, a, a client that I'm working with right now. She's actually a returned Peace Corps volunteer. So you've been following Peace Corps, you know, all these Peace Corps volunteers were evacuated very quickly. And I was talking to her day and she on her own, she's taken the Johns Hopkins five hour COVID training uh, because that's what she wants to do. She says, I'm just going to do this. And then she's doing some training with the Red Cross. Um, and she's, she's not volunteering, but she hopes to volunteer. So she's just doing that on kind of her own initiative to do those kind of things. That's the kind of stuff that Andy's talking about. It says, go out there and embrace things and kind of get into them ahead of, ahead of when you would actually be looking for work sometime. Cool. Yeah, we mentioned the, the COVID and uh, Red Cross, I don't know how long it's going to last, but I think through June, they have this um, almost a contest for getting people to do training on their websites. Of course, oh, wow. it's to their advantage. To I mean, I, I actually was on a call that was doing mapping somewhere in some third world country. They, it's amazing the stuff that they do. I had no idea they did that, actually. So they just really are eager to train people and it gets you, these are Zoom calls, it gets you into a network with the people volunteering and the people at Red Cross. So it's a lot of fun. So I see a question here from Tiffany and Tiffany's asking how can she use this experience? Uh, she was a Fulbright um, uh, awardee in Colombia in, in 14, 2014, 2015 and she's been working in international education spaces as a teacher, a nonprofit administrator and a study abroad teacher and how can she uh, use this time strategically to further her experience in order to uh, perhaps be uh, considered uh, as a foreign service officer candidate. Um, I think that what you're doing is already uh, really important. Um, the fact that uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, you're actually taking on some experience that's directly related to that and important to a particular community, whether it's your immediate community or one that's more internationally focused, I don't think that matters as much. Yeah, it was my experience that um, the Foreign Service was very interested in your international experiences, but also very interested in your experiences at home or, or nationally and your knowledge of what is going on in this community so that you are a goodwill ambassador about the United States and what can happen. And this is a great opportunity to say, in my community, this is what happened and was very uh, um, important to the well-being, not only of myself, but for the people that I was trying to help. So I think the continue, it sounds to me like you're on the right, right path and I would just keep doing that. I wonder if any of our participants are volunteering or doing internships or projects they might wanna share about. That'd be great. And I think you can raise your hand or chat. Looks like Elizabeth has her hand up. I don't know if Elizabeth is there ready to ask her question. Hi, y'all. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. OK, great. Thank you, first off, uh, for this fantastic presentation. Um, when I saw it pop up um, in the notification, I, I immediately signed up because this is exactly what I was trying to do these past few weeks and trying to find volunteer opportunities. Um, my question is actually for David. And sure. you kind of mentioned, uh, uh, you alluded to this a bit about USA Jobs and the resumes and uh, where to place strategic volunteering. But I, I want to get your, your perspective or any of the other panelists on where would you think is best to articulate these strategic uh, volunteer service learning type of, of opportunities on your resume, like on your LinkedIn, because I find sometimes I'm a bit confused whether to put it in volunteer experience or to put it like in right. experience, because sometimes, especially on those project-based um, opportunities, you are gaining really great transferable right. skills um, that could help, you know, for example, working in the foreign service in the future. So yeah. can you elaborate? I, I think one of the things it recognizes is a gradation in volunteer experiences, right? So if you volunteer on an infrequent basis, but it's still consistent and what you're doing isn't rising to substantive work. It is it that you're going in and you're, you know, manning a, 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 a help desk or something like that, that is kind of continual or, you know, even volunteering at a conference, uh, you know, taking registration. That's different than volunteering that is substance around a project. I think that substance of volunteering around a project is something that's more akin to employment 
than it is to volunteerism. And so what you want to do is it's, it's unfortunate that LinkedIn makes that distinction sometime because I know increasingly what people are seeing is even it's even funny the way we use the term volunteer, you know, uh, people go in the Peace Corps are volunteers, but they get paid and people that go into uh, AmeriCorps sometimes they're volunteers, they get paid, but they're called volunteers. So we, we kind of throw this word around a lot, but I would think the more substantive it is and the more project based it is, the more likely you really should be listing it as, as, a, as an experience rather than something that's more volunteer based. Excellent. I, I also think that uh, in terms of where to put it on your resume, if your resume is listed chronologically and you, you are not in another um, full time job at the moment, uh, then you could put it at the top, which yeah. is, you know, right as you just, you know, the first thing the person reads at and wanting to know what your professional experience is. I think that's just fine. You don't have to put it at the bottom at all. And then be, be, be careful. I mean, not be careful, but be, be sure to list the skills that you use in that particular volunteer experience because that can be persuasive to people. Right. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yep. Other questions here? I see in the chat room somebody's training to be a crisis counselor for text yeah. crisis counseling hotline. I was not aware of that. It sounds like an amazing opportunity. Yeah. And I know that I was really thrilled to see the Hopkins doing the three COVID tracing training because every single city in every state is going to be doing a lot of that. So I thought that was um, Timely. And I think that um, the CDC website has a lot of job opportunities actually in that arena across the country, as do most cities. Yeah. Other comments or questions people have? Okay. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I just want to add about virtual volunteering. I was uh, talking about my experiences with hiring two interns, is that um, uh, I think we're, we are going to see a trend towards kind of the virtual volunteering and virtual internship. I think uh, certainly in the short term, maybe in the long term. So uh, a lot of what we were talking about, you know, is it a safe environment to work in and so forth. That's really important if you're physically going somewhere. But increasingly, there are things that we can contribute to in this virtual space, doing research, uh, teaching and mentoring, uh, doing some sort of organizing for a group, some sort of scheduling, uh, web design, all these different things that we didn't maybe think about in terms of volunteering before, because we think of volunteering as very tactile sometimes, but it can be very virtual. So think a little bit about that a little bit more, and I think that may open up some more spaces for people. Yep. Yeah, I would say a number of you certainly have uh, more current uh, IT skills than an older generation person yes, for sure. and, and uh, volunteering. We need your help. Yeah, they yes, need yes, your help. Yes, a lot yes. of people need your help. Uh, and it's very important. And if we continue to work at home and, and uh, interact with friends uh, in more Zoom conferences, um, there are some people that are just not as far along in, in knowing how to use the, access those kind of um, facilities. So uh, I think volunteering that is a, is, is a really important uh, role as well. I'm going to add what our last bullet, which I've yes. passed by, but this is a time to really take care of yourself as mm -hmm. well. Yes. Um, it's, it's a time uh, when anxiety is sort of the bottom layer of all of our lives now. Um, and even I think as things begin to open up, it's, we are going to be put in positions of making decisions on our own that we have to support. Um, and so, take care of yourself, be present to your family and friends, um, and I, watch some movies, have some fun too. I mean, it's, you know. Yeah, I, I do uh, concur with Liz. We're now going into a different phase of this crisis, right? It's the opening up phase, which is gonna put, put choices on us. And there's a lot of confusing messages and a lot of us are really aware because we've got elderly, grandparents at home or whatever of the risk that still continue. And I'm not a public health expert and I know it's not Liz and Andy's area anyhow, but we are listening to the public health people. And one of the things I keep saying is that you've got to make your own decisions and think them through. Notwithstanding whatever this is opening and this governor says this and this governor says that, it's really an individualized choice that needs to be made based on your own risk, your own circumstances. So um, th that's really important to, to continue. Don't 
it's not a it's not a pack decision it's your decision not, right absolutely and yeah. peer you got to be careful of peer pressure you got to yes. feel comfortable with your own decisions um it's going to unfold slowly and you need you want to be safe and come through this right absolutely exactly um, we, I can't tell you how much we've enjoyed presenting these webinars the yeah. last several weeks, and um, uh, we would very much uh, like to uh, wish you the very best and, and that uh, all of you will have a job someday, that's for sure. And thanks to Fulbright and to Shaz and Lisa for supporting us on this and presenting these wonderful webinars. Thank you very much. Webinars. Really, it's been w wonderful working with you all. Shaz. That's absolutely wonderful uh, for the three of you to have given such um, amazing um, presentations and sharing your expertise with our community that really needs it at this time. Um, I must say uh, these have been valuable to all kinds of um, participants. I've gotten very good feedback. Um, and for the participants who uh, answered our survey, thank you so much for doing that. We really appreciate about 50 or 60 responses have come in. We'll be sending out another survey at the end of this uh, webinar, and we hope that you can really give us concrete feedback on all the webinars we've been doing so that we can plan the next phase. Uh, the next phase is going to look at specific subject matters that uh, pertain to people's training, um, expertise in global health. You want to search a career in global health. Uh, what does that look like? Conflict resolution, um, peace studies like David Smith is an expert on uh, conflict uh, mm -hmm. peace studies. Um, so that's the next phase and we're hoping that we will still engage a lot of you in that arena. Uh, we are looking at what kind of speakers we're going to have. Um, these will most likely be monthly webinars. Again, they'll be uh, probably branded un under the Fulbright Forum platform uh, in which a topic of expertise in a career will be discussed. So I'm hoping many of you stay tuned for that. Um, and again, thank you for the survey. We got very good feedback. Um, I want to thank my colleague, Lisa, who uh, puts in a lot of hard work planning these webinars and um, Andy, Liz and David, we would not have had the opportunity to have <laughs> professional webinars without your expertise. So on behalf of the association, I would personally like to thank you for that. And I would like all the, uh, to thank all the attendees for giving us your time. We know that there are a lot of conflicting uh, pressures on your time and you have things to do and you take time to you what we offer and uh, these would be successful without you being the audience uh, that you are. So feel free to email us anytime and we look forward to continuing the professional development conversation.